Do you remember when you were back in high school and your thoughts leading up to your senior year that nothing was more scary than the idea of getting to prom, senior prom, how big of a deal senior prom was going to be, and how does everything get to happen, and how is everything going to go right? Well, it turns out you had a lot less to worry about than this girl's date did, didn't you? Hardly anybody ever finds out that their actions really actually hurt other people. People don't get better, they just get smarter. When you get smarter, you don't stop pulling the wings off flies, you just think of better reasons for doing it. Lots of kids say they feel sorry for Carrie White. Mostly girls, and that's a laugh, but I bet none of them understand what it's like to be Carrie White every second of every day. And they don't really care. But someone ought to try and be sorry in a way that counts. In a way that means something. He had said it would be good that they would see to it. Well, she would see to it. They'd better not start anything. they just better not. She did not know if her gift had come from the Lord of Light or of Darkness, and now, finally finding that she did not care which, she was overcome with an almost indescribable relief, as if a huge weight, long carried, had slipped from her shoulders. Hey, what's up, bookworms and constant readers? Mike here today to talk more King, Stephen King. Something I'm going to start doing now is kind of going back through King's uh, bibliography and kind of in order going through and reviewing his, uh, his, his books by publication order. And that means, of course, I'm going to be starting today with Carrie, the very, very peculiar debut novel that actually has a legacy in its own outside of, uh, you know, actually Pig's Blood and, uh, and, and you know, things like that. The funny story about this, and I think by now just about everyone knows, if you're a King fan at all, you know the story. But those who don't know, uh, when King was uh, still just kind of a teacher and kind of doing this as like a side thing, the rumor always was that uh, he had written this story about this girl with telekinetic powers and that uh, he was so unhappy with how it was going, he got so frustrated that he threw the transcript in the trash. And King's now wife, Tabitha, got it out of the trash and uh, basically launched his career. Uh, if that, the, the whole, that's been debated numerous times. I mean, King himself even brings it up, you know, that his wife's never let him live it down kind of thing. And, uh, and it's, it's a funny story. Uh, you know, I like to believe that the guy had enough talent that, you know, he would have eventually gotten something else to, to work. But uh, that just kind of adds to the whole legacy of Stephen King. If you guys don't know about how big of a Stephen King a fan I am, I did a whole video right here about uh, how I became a constant reader. So I won't rehash too much of that, but I just want to kind of introduce that I'm going to kind of start going through these in publication order and talking about them. These will be very mild to no spoilers, so no worries about that. I feel like by now everyone knows the story of Carrie, even if they haven't read it. I feel like my mom, who would not touch horror with someone else's eyeballs, uh, knows the story of Carrie at this point. It's just been ingrained into our pop culture about the, uh, the girl with telekinetic powers who's a social outcast and uh, finally loses it and just, you know, cooks everybody. Uh, but uh, it's much more than that. I feel like something I've always said about King that is so great is his ability to write the coming-of-age story. And in this, he writes it from the perspective of a teenage girl. You know, obviously, a teenage girl, your body is going through changes. Again, I'm a guy. It's going to sound really weird talking about this, but obviously your body is going through changes. And, you know, when the book opens up with her... Uh, having her first period at school in a girl's locker room, which is one of the roughest places that you could go through that in, right? Uh, I, I know that, you know, guys, we've kind of got this thing about, oh, you know, in the locker room, you know, guys, will they, they get beat up or something like that. Uh, junior high girls are quite vicious in their own right. Uh, just the horror stories I've heard from my wife about how cruel uh, girls can be. 
Uh, so I, I don't. I think it might be. While guys might be physical abuse, women undergo a lot more emotional abuse. And when you're going through a situation like that with a mother like Carrie White, who's one of the greatest villains that King's ever written, uh, obviously she's not prepared for this moment. So that's obviously already something that she doesn't know what's wrong, and then she's got to deal with everyone there knowing what's going on and, and treating her really, really horribly about it. And it's just the first of a series of events of bad things that happen to Carrie White. She's a... Uh, Relatable in a way that most people who didn't undergo being a social outcast, see myself being the big book reader I am, being the creepy Stephen King guy that always had his nose in a book in school. Uh, I was like that up until about freshman year in high school when I learned how to play baseball and uh, made the baseball team. And obviously that made me a lot more, you know, popular than it was with, uh, with, uh, you know, just being the, the kid who was always reading a creepy horror book. Uh, I always like to say that. When it came to like a social cast, I was somewhere in the middle because, uh, yeah, okay, most people think you became a jock. That means you must have picked on the No, man. I had had eight years of school before that of being a social outcast, being bullied, being picked on, you know, and then freshman year I, you know, grew to six foot one and, and, and started playing sports and stuff like that. But I obviously never forgot where I came from, so it was easy for me to be like, okay, you know, stop, stop fucking with that kid. You know, leave him alone. He doesn't, he can't help it that you know his parents probably didn't teach him how to act around people, or he's suffering from autism or something like that. Leave him alone. You know, so that was always something I like to. I want to have like a moral high ground about, but I always, I always felt good about that. I, I was not the type who you know went through that and then they got into what they call popular or something like that. And then they just started shitting on all the people below them. I always felt like I was always a happy medium between that. I never really wanted to be popular or anything like that. Whereas Carrie, you know, would feels like she would very much, you know, give everything to be popular. But really, I think what it all stems from in this is her very overbearing, over-religious mother who is very different from King's other villains. And then I've always said that I, the, the monsters in Stephen King's stories are always scary, but I feel like the real monsters of his books are the human characters. And I always constantly see Carrie come up as like one of Stephen King's best villains. And Carrie's not the villain of the story. Mrs. White is the, is the, is the villain of the story. I mean, she punishes this girl in the most awful ways, locks her in a closet. Uh, it's just, it's, look, I underwent some rough, rough stuff as a kid, and I felt like I had a privileged life compared to what this girl goes through. You know, I grew up in a Pentecostal family. Uh, thankfully, by the time I was a little older, uh, my mom finally took the thing where she said, like, look, I'm, I went through that as a kid, and I hated it, so I'm not going to make you guys go through it. Just when your grandma's in town, make sure that you pretend like we do, you know? So it was that kind of thing. She was still scared of her mother at that point. So uh, regardless of how you feel about a, a, a religion, anything like that. That's not really what this discussion is. It's just you've seen those those people who are seriously, seriously, seriously into the religion, and they project it onto everyone else. Well, it's like that times the power of the sun with with with, with Carrie White's mom, and it, I think that just only you know stunts her growth even more the way where she's even more socially awkward, and and she has more of this pent up rage, and it. it when it finally gets to the point where, you know, these girls pick on her so much that she, you know, she be friends with the teachers and she befriends, befriends this other girl who feels like she wants to do the right thing. Like I was talking about someone who wants you to stop picking on those, those, those people that are considered social outcasts. And, and she wants her, her boyfriend to take Carrie to prom. And it's actually genuine. It's not a trick. It's not a trap or anything like that. But there's this other group of her friends that obviously think take advantage of this. And you have the famous, I don't feel like it's a spoiler at this point because everybody knows this. You have the famous dumping the pig blood on her after they stuff the ballot box and, uh, and, and make her the prom queen. And that's when the whole horror of this story actually starts. And to me, yes, you probably saw the Brian De Palma movie by now. And uh, I, that's one of the best Stephen King adaptations there ever was. And it's visceral, and it's jarring, and it's just, it's, it's freaking scary. And I feel like at that point, that's what people think of. So when I went back and I read this recently, I mean, I read this when I was 15. I had seen the movie, but whatever. I read it when I was 15, and then I read it again, uh, I think in 2016. I read it again when I started my reread. And I was like, okay, I think I feel like at this point, I almost feel like I know that movie version better. 
in this, the way that King chooses to tell it with like news reports, police reports, things like that, you can tell he was, you know, a first time novelist. Uh, it's something that I don't feel like a narrative decision he would have made even five years from, from when this was released. But it doesn't take away from it, really. Uh, but I, I do think that the movie is a little more scary than the book is. Uh, you get the, the big moments of tension and stuff like that. And in the movie, you get the Friday the 13th ending, you know, with the little hand through the rocks and all that, that you don't get in the book or whatever. Uh, but it's a very, very heartbreaking story, really, if you think about it. That, uh, you know, this, this, this girl's thinking that, you know, she's finally broken through. And, you know, she's finally going to have the life that she thought she was going to have. She's finally learned to stand up to her mother and things like that. And, you know, then it all goes to, you know, Hades in a handbag. And that's just, that's just, again, King's earlier stuff, he had no problems writing an ending that wasn't exactly cheery. Uh, I mean, you get these things. The big story about Stephen King is he can't write an ending. Uh, to me, he can write an ending. It's just the bad ones really intend to stick with you. I don't feel like this had a bad ending at all. Uh, it just it wasn't the uh, typical Disney ending that, that people look for. And I feel like that's kind of what built upon his legacy leading into Salem's Lot, which came up next after this. And it's, uh, it's a very, very high recommend for me if you read this. I have told people I feel like if you're curious about Stephen King and you want to get into Stephen King, this is a good one to start because, look, it's not that big of a time commitment. It's a very short book. Uh, I feel like it's very easy to read. Uh, he doesn't spend the hundreds and hundreds of pages elaborating on things like he does in some of his later books, which don't bother me. I love Stephen King's prose, so his long books don't bother me at all. I know that bothers a lot of other people. Wow, that was 100 pages that I didn't even need. To me, they need it because he's a master of character development. So if I have a criticism of this book, it's that it's too short. Uh, it, it doesn't develop uh, enough uh, of Carrie in what she's actually thinking but uh, it, it's a very good start to his career, clearly, uh, since we are 40 years later, and this book is still held very high regard. And this is a this is a first edition, by the way. I was, you cannot believe the story on this. I was looking for a first edition of this, and obviously they're astronomical, right? Uh, someone was selling this at a garage sale. Had no idea what they had. 50 cents. Do you even want to know what this goes for on eBay in this good of condition with the dust jacket? Yeah, it's crazy. Not a book club edition. This is a first edition. Yeah, so... Uh, this is obviously one of my prized things. In fact, I didn't even want to take it off the shelf for this video. I was afraid I might hurt it. But anyway. Sorry for the interruption. When I created that carry video, I did not know I was going to be doing this uh, into the multiverse format, uh, describing you know Easter eggs and connections within Stephen King's multiverse. So I didn't actually mention any for my carry video. And there are, there are a couple that I feel like I should talk about. But, you know, this being his first one, there wasn't going to be a ton. Uh, I'll try to keep it pretty much kind of spoiler-free. I don't think that any of these connections are really going to uh, make a big difference uh, if you read these stories I'm going to mention. But here are a couple uh, that I could think of right off the bat. Uh, first up, in The Body, in different seasons. That's Stand By Me for you guys who've watched uh, just the movies. Uh, Teddy Duchamp, uh, he is the uh, owner of Teddy's uh, Amico in Chamberlain, Maine. This is Carrie's hometown, Chamberlain, Maine. Uh, friends with Gordy in that story. So uh, there's a very easy connection there uh in road work written by richard bachman originally which is we all know now is stephen king uh margaret white that's carrie's mom she worked in a laundromat called the blue ribbon laundry and this is also located in chamberlain and also in road work here uh burt dawes uh he worked in a laundromat called the blue ribbon laundry so uh there's another easy connection. But, but wait, there's one more. There's one more. In uh, Collected in Night Shift, there's a story called The Mangler. And in that, it has about a press machine that becomes possessed by a demon. Uh, guess what laundry that press machine was at? You guessed it, the Blue Ribbon Laundry. So uh, even back then, he was already kind of thinking forward on these. But however, a lot of these earlier ones, King tried to get kind of meta with some things. And he actually... I guess you would say decanonize some of these from uh, from uh, his multiverse. I don't know. Some of you just think, just whatever, whatever. But uh, you think about something like in The Dead Zone. In The Dead Zone, there is uh, a reporter or somebody, I think, that accuses Johnny of, of setting a fire to Kathy's Roadhouse with using just his mind. And he responds, just like in that book, Carrie. And so, I mean, obviously there, if this was all happening in the same universe, obviously he wouldn't uh, have said Something like that. And the other one, I just got a couple of Easter eggs that I did want to mention. Uh, these, again, don't really have to do with the multiverse. But I figure, you know, while we're doing it, why not like a little trivia or whatever. Uh, there is a story in Nightmare and Dreamscapes uh, called The Fifth Quarter. 
and in it there is a folk singer named um I'm sorry, in, in Carrie there is a folk singer named John Swithin, and he's the guy that is actually singing at Carrie's prom when the when the whole big event goes down. But John Swithin is an alias that Stephen King used to write the story the fifth quarter when he submitted to uh to Cavalier magazine back in the early 70s. So uh, that's a little fun one. And also the one of uh, Carrie White's teacher's names was uh, was Edwin King. So, uh, you know, Stephen King's middle name is Edwin. So that was uh, quite an easy one. So uh, going forward, obviously, I'll be putting this in video. But like I said, I hadn't actually thought of this plan uh, until after I'd already recorded that Carrie video. So I just kind of wanted to insert that in here because I didn't want to have the first video have zero mentions of the multiverse when that's kind of the theme of the whole show. So uh, uh, I'll get you get back to that uh, regular program now. Uh, yeah, that, so that's, uh, that's Carrie. Uh, very, very high recommend. Uh, if I was given a grade, I'd say a three out of five. And in my grading scale, uh, like I've talked about before, people might not understand that. They think three out of five. Apparently three out of five is a bad grade now to people. Uh, here's how I do it. Five, all-time classic. Books we're going to be reading 100 years from now. Four, absolutely great. You need to read it ASAP. Three, really, really good. I recommend that you read it when you can. Two, I'd probably go ahead and skip this one. And one, go, burn it. Just burn it and never think about it again. So that's my grade scale. So uh, good, I recommend that you read it as soon as you can. Yeah, I think that's a good grade for this for this first for the debut novel by Stephen King. So, uh, guys, have you read Carrie? What did you think? Uh, did, did Mrs. White scare you like she scared me? Uh, like I said, I grew up in a religious family, uh, but nothing to that level. But uh, it, it definitely gave me a little bit of context to make it somewhat relatable. Uh, I, I know another criticism of this book is, you know, well, you've got a guy you know, writing about a teenage girl or whatever. 